two. Yes. I think we'll go there. We'll share that one. And when you're ready, I would like to. Can you everybody hear me okay? I was having bandwidth issues earlier, so this hopefully this is all right. You, I can hear you great, it's Teresa. Okay, great. I'm gonna try to. Uh, let's see how do I, I don't know how I'm gonna quite shut off my. Well, I'll just go for it. All right. Well, welcome everybody and good evening. Thank you for coming together and for the invitation from the Plant Society to have me speak today. Um, I really, you know, have to acknowledge also where I'm at today. I'm in Arcata, um, in the Weah Territory. Typically, I'm up at my other place in Orleans, but um, now working out of the Arcata Research Lab quite a bit here by Humboldt State, and so I'm here on the coast more. But anyways, as an overview, uh, really for my objectives today is wanted to, to describe, you know, really some historical sources, ethnographic information, um, how indigenous knowledge is used to guide my research, and a lot of the way I compiled this information for you provide this as a regional example of how tribes utilize the ecosystems, habitats, and how I kind of consider and define resources, particularly those plants and fungi species of importance in our bioregion. The information here is for just advice, but not really, um, you know, for going out and conducting your own wild crafting or gathering and also acknowledge federal, state, and tribal and county rules and regulations if you do try to gather any of the materials I'm talking about. And then also be you know, aware and conscious that there is a living tribal member who are gathering and using places and, and when where you can respect that tribal gathering and ceremony uses of the mentioned areas or species that I include here. And a lot of this information for me was taught to me by Laverne Ferris Glaze. She passed away a few years ago and it was a very prominent lady in the Karut tribe and with the Yurok community uh, on her basketry and other educational force work. So a little bit, you know, kind of going over this is to think about um, what is the biodiversity in this area. And so we think about, you know, since the Pleistocene, over 13,000 years, if not longer now, has been um, native inhabitants, or indigenous people here of this region. And think about how those couple of human and natural systems um, adapted to the environment and really changed the environment, and environment changed them as a culture and cultures of people over time. I think a, a key part of this is just recognizing at a bigger level, um, just the convergence of the climate Siskiyou bioregion, both from the Pacific Northwest, the California Mediterranean type, um, Pacific Maritime, the Great Basin, and the convergence of those in our unique area of the world. Equally to that is also the convergence, as you see here, the Northwest culture type, plateau and woodlands, California and Great Basin that are equally as diverse and extensive that are of a convergence zone through thousands of years in this area. So really, you know, we might think of this area as a unique geologic area and biodiversity, but it's also very culturally rich um, with both linguistic and other cultural genetic diversity of native people here. Particular to this, um, and I look at Jeff Lalanne's work here. He's a retired archaeologist um, with the Rogue Siskiyou National Forest from some years ago I've worked with. As you know, we have here on the Oregon California border um, our unique watersheds, but also we see as um, the map was shown earlier for the land acknowledgement, thank you, a quite diversity of tribal people who are very linguistically diverse as well and that within this bioregion that I'll be talking about. I think, and you know, kind of compiling this and looking at, I often focus on a mid lower Klamath, but here's just a great example of this map depicting all the different villages based on linguistic group. So the purple would be the Tatutni Rogue um, and Talawa. And down in that lower part of the coast, you have uh, Athabascan speaking, you have some other Holkon speaking groups like the Karuk and the Red, and you have the Tekilma, which are Panutian um, in their linguistic background. So you really see a, a great also diversity of people living um, in the same bioregion and having similar cultural practices. So when I talk generally about the tribes, also acknowledge there is a lot of diversity within this area as well. And kind of looking at the distribution of villages and where people were at and living um, in the watersheds and tribes of, that reside in the same area today. I think, you know, in looking at when we consider just how the landscapes are used, not only we do have the gradient from the coast to the interior and elevationally, but through this was a nexus of villages along the rivers and major creeks, um, but then an extreme, uh, very diversified network going at many areas across the landscape of tribal trail systems. And so we have foot trails along riparian areas, we have foot trails 
that are going over often ridge systems and between watersheds. And it's the connection of that inter-tribal, inter international commerce of these groups that really diversified our region, particularly when you think of these corridors as influential areas of cultural fire use or indigenous fire stewardship to manage many vegetation types. And so we can look at kind of this elevational gradient from often our white oak or Gary oak and black oak up to our true fir and pine communities and elevational gradient. And we have definitely a lot of lightning here in our area, but there also, I think maybe isn't so recognized as diversity of cultural burning practices that also affected much of the plant communities and diversity. Um, that definitely a time of Euro-American colonization, but also when thinking about our reference conditions and attributes of what we want to restore towards being also indigenous legacies that we might want to, in tribal partnerships today, think about bringing those cultural stewardship practices as part of the landscape restoration strategy. My general framing for this is thinking about resources as tangible and intangible elements of the environment, ranging across scales from landscapes to site to even objects such as artifacts and other factors of that. Um, and also emotionally or kind of our psychological wellness of state of mind of being a person of place or indigenousness, um, linking the past and present and future, future cultural knowledge systems and related practices. And for many tribes, they um, don't make a distinction between cultural and natural resources as we do maybe in the legal sense, but that are resources that are used to perpetuate tribal customs, practices, and knowledge systems. And then with that, we have a framing of habitats as those landscape or places that support tribal ceremony and subsistence um, practices that can be biophysically or social culturally defined like characteristics and may have a single or multiple resources of cultural value or tribal value within that. And so the picture I show here, you can look at some of the fire effects on those Douglas fir trees that came from the meadow that then would affect the soil properties or the soil conditions and surface feel of the more huckleberry, the tan oak forest. And you see the Matsutake mushrooms there as a mycorrhiza associate with the huckleberries and oaks. And each of those are in their own unique way, a habitat type for that type of collection. But those resources in this habitat are often harvested at different times of the year. And that is those sources of habitat when they found. Also, I think, you know, kind of in, in redefining what is the, the socio-cultural um, coupled systems approach or the natural and um, human coupled system is to think about what is the effect of lightning itself on these potential fire um, regimes and vegetation types as an outcome. And then this middle example is really one exhibiting the effect of more open pine and oak and understory for diversity with some fire intolerance, but really it's a, um, the increased diversification of fire that promoted a large level of diversity. Um, and also I'd say would increase resistance to maybe moderating the extreme ranges of variability that we see climatically, um, but also increasing resource predictability through if lightning was not adequate, then cultural burning to maintain those resources and access of those. So, you know, at the core of this and my work of many tribes is this worldview of nature as hardware store, supermarket, pharmacy, and church. And so we think about ecological services, um, my colleague, Bill Tripp of the Crew Tribe, often says cultural burning is human services for ecosystems, as well as indigenous stewardship practices, that this diversity um, and productivity equal the form of wealth and security, good health and uh, adaptability or survival within this environment. And it's the ecological integrity or the services for both human and non-human species. Many tribal people talk about their stewardship responsibility for their relations in nature. And at the core of that indigenousness is a people of place, and I think today in kind of our landscape restoration strategies is thinking about our grandchildren as effectiveness monitors and the outcome thinking many generations or decades or even centuries for the form of management and what we do today has those lasting or potentially implications for years to come. Some of my way of framing this is um, the indigenous perspective of that fire's medicine in the context of prescribed burning. Um, is the right amount of fire to maintain that ecological integrity and services of the landscape. And for our area as a fire prone ecosystem, having many fire dependent species um, help define a cultural fire regime. And through those cultural adaptations to climate and the environment, these tribes in this area forming fire dependent cultures. And at the core of this is that indigenous knowledge and fire stewardship. And then really though also, as I was mentioning with the trails and the villages, this can vary across the landscape, both in time and space, um, affecting different ecosystems and habitats, whether it's along the coastal bluffs or some of those high alpine meadows. 
there are these elements or factors of uh, fire, um, traditional fire knowledge. Um, my colleague, Mary Huffman, who's the director of the Indigenous Peoples Burning Network with the Nature Conservancy, um, she did this in her synthesis of looking at geology and topography and soils, the vegetation or fuel attributes of a system, weather and indigenous knowledge around weather and how that affects fire behavior. And then we think about fire operations, um, both traditional and even the way tribes are about reinstating fire today, the operational aspects of that. And then with the eye towards post-fire, often the metric of uh, time since fire by severity, um, as looking at fire effects on those valued habitats and resources contained within those. And then thinking about fire governance, whether it's our government to government relationship between the federal agencies and tribes, um, or governance in a traditional sense, that relate to other social factors um, between families and villages and even between tribes. And at the core of this is often that intergenerational teaching and training around fire effects re uh, related to that resource use or other subsistence and ceremonial practices. Here's just a short list of kind of some of the main reasons that are documented for tribal fire use in our area. I'd say one of the ones I'll touch upon tonight quite a bit is crop management. Um, for berries and nuts and other seed resources, pest management to reduce the pests that affect those food resources, range or forage quality being another one, um, addressing clearing um, areas for travel is a big one I've already mentioned, and then around particularly basket materials and other aspects of that for why tribes burned and want to reinstate fire today. My colleague, Kat Anderson, the retired NRCS ethnobotanist, um, now down in Phil Davis area. She has her book, Tending the Wild, I'd recommend that. But she has this example here of you know, management variables that have different types of effects, whether it's fire or the season in which that's done, affecting that native plant. These all being exercised through different resource management techniques or what I call indigenous fire stewardship, such as burning, coppicing, even weeding or transplanting. Harvesting variables uh, coming back in the way in which you harvest or steward that, kind of more of that indigenous horticulture or agroforestry aspect, all affecting a native plant that leads to a renewable resource and kind of the conservation of that organism and its population, or in many ways, not having that adequate stewardship can actually be parts of uh, exploration or the really a reduced population viability of that species of uh, the valued resource. Going through here, I'm um, just going to touch on a few ecosystems I think were maybe more anthropogenically or tribally managed um, and often less lightning affected areas. And so we can see these Gary Oak um, prairie systems were an important aspect of that. This picture from Bald Hills of the Chimula people in Redwood National Park. Often burning there um, to fill facilitate hazelnut and burning was to reduce the filbert weevil and moth, which also affects the acorns, but in this case the hazelnut and then the sprouting of the hazelnuts there as a food resource that was important to many tribes. Also, another one is to think about the Indian potatoes or corms, many of these geophytes um, that were found in these systems being family gardens in really important areas for tribes maintaining that root food um, relationship. And those will be often cooked in pit ovens and um, having these areas maintained, really keeping the shrubs and trees from encroaching upon those. Iris is a very important one, whether it's the um, iris on the coast or the Tanax more interior, but that being used as a string on each iris leaf, there's two dental floss type fibers along the leading edge. Uh, after uh, irises are burned, they re-sprout back about the second year. They have those nice fibers kind of mature and and then they would be extracted out and then thigh spun to make cordage, such as you see the fishing net technology here. And I use the iris as an important example of having a very sophisticated fishing technology for salmon, sturgeon, um, eels, many other anatomous fish. But at the core of that was having the superior net material from the iris fibers um, as seen here on the bottom of these net sinkers to be able to catch and, and make those nets for fisheries. Looking at a range of different acorns, nuts, and other seed resources, we have a variety of species that are important there. Everything from the oaks and pines and some of the other shrubs down to the forbs. And in many ways, the loss of fire because of fire exclusion and suppression, but also earlier on with a colonization of settlement by Euro-Americans, the cessation or the ending of native burning began to see a large transformation of um, forest in our region. Definitely densification and encroachment on many of these former oak woodlands. 
And I think it's the the legacy of the kind of the loss or the, the loss of these legacy hardwoods, which is another component of conservation interest. Particularly, you see here in the picture I have here, a large old black oak that snapped off. It's been overtaken by the Douglas fir, other fir, and other fire intolerance like the tan oak around that. And what used to maybe be a more thriving, dominated oak, black, uh, oak woodland with black oak is now pretty much changed into our more mixed conifer hardwood forest type in absence of fire over the last hundred years. And thinking about how we diversify our perspective on the uh, distribution and abundance of oaks versus our conservation species like the spotted owl or the fisher in our region. Um, my part of my work with other California tribes and uh, Dr. Jonathan Long has really been leading this up is thinking about just when and where you would have a different type of forest that would promote oak diversity. And so kind of more on this north aspect riparian area, you can have more close canopy forest of an oak in there that has the broken off uh, stems that support maybe more of that close canopy um, older forest species dependent, or you can have on more of the southern aspect, lower slope position, um, just around a hill across there, that's prairie or meadow that can support full crown black oaks and have that for acorn production and more early cereal habitat. So it's coming together to understand how we think about the heterogeneity or the diversity across our landscape that can promote different values through different fire use and how we align those between conservation and the reintroduction of fire. My other example here is um, many of the tribes in our area also relied upon tan oak acorns. Um, and there's this kind of indicator of the white top good versus brown top bad, which are the buggy uh, or infertile ones. And that indicator there would be burning at the time of year when you see those infertile ones first fall and then the buggy infested ones with the weevil and the moth. And as you start to see the white top good acorns fall, burning when you have that fuel receptivity um, and the weather conditions, and then also around that same time, there's other resources that can be harvested um, that then would also facilitate collecting in the years after you burn that and just to attract game there. So here's kind of a picture of my acorn orchard um, outside of Orleans, uh, the one year burning, actually that was the 2016 picture of me in the bottom, but then burning last year around that same tree. So I repeated fire every couple of years and learning from me, this from the people like Laverne or my grandfather here, during our subsistence uh, gathering practices. So um, really, you know, I think in some ways we think, well, how can we align tribal fire management and the eye towards plant diversity for our, our modern or contemporary needs? And an example here of the Klamath River Trex hosted by the Nature Conservancy, the Mid-Klamath Watershed Council and the Karuk tribe. They had Yurok and Karuk igniters on my property here. You see that in 2015, the year after my Yurok cousin came up and we gathered a bunch of acorns. And you know, for me, that burn really achieved the multiple objectives, such as reduction of hazardous fuels in the wildland urban interface, protecting the egress route around between me and my neighbors, maintaining the quality of enhancing that oak woodland or orchard on my property, um, served as a research burn for my Berkeley student, and then also improved food security um, for my Yurok and Kruk family here at my own place. So just as an example, how we brought up all, all that together in a modern context. Another important element um, is the Oregon White Oak community. Um, definitely, there's been an encroachment of that and the management of those might be selective thinning of taking out and removing some of those other species that have come in to threaten or reduce the productivity of the oak woodland and then really keep an eye towards that acorn production as well. Sugar pines, um, these across the area, and I might point out right now, Reg Poland's 19, uh, Six, 1996 um, inhabitants, an environmental overview of the native inhabitants of Southwestern Oregon, available at the Southern Oregon University's um, digital library site, has a great overview of many of the culmin, uh, compiled information about tribal burning. There's great accounts in here about sugar pine management from the Tequilma, the Tootenai, the Karuk, Yurok, and other tribes. Many tribes in our area managed sugar pine groves with fire. They were family owned sites. There's multiple uses from these trees, the sap for chewing gum, for healing wounds, even an account of uh, trading that to the coast for shellfish poisoning. The nuts are highly, um, when burned, reducing the pests, and the tree has reduced competition and more water availability, um, definitely increases the pine nut quality. And then many of the, also the wood was used for different ceremonial aspects or even for canoes in our area. Ponderosa pine being another one that's often um, attributed to maintaining those open habitats there. The uh, roots were used in basketry, uh, going around often to hazel sticks. 
Um, the sap was used for medicines and the treatment of other wounds. And then for many tribes, and I didn't think about this so much until I started finding these legacy old ponderosa pines along trails and seeing either blaze marks, but also uniquely what probably is the um, old scar from being the cambium being peeled out of a tree. And that was used as food by many tribes. And also I find it more commonly now here that I'm seeing it um, in our area of the Rogue and the Klamath region. I think another important element um, is thinking about manzanitas or shrubs. This one, both, you know, many diversity of species and Michael Kaufman's book about the manzanitas in our region, but the green and the white leaf are one of the two more common and culturally used ones. The berries are one of the higher natural sources of sugar. The wood was used. You could look at this manzanita example. Any of that dead decaying branch wood will be broken out and used for heating or ceremonial wood, which in some ways kind of increased the, this manzanita to resistance of having a dead uh, fuel content and the more life um, proportion of branches also resistant to fires and being burned in and around those often with the true strategy either as a burl sprout or as a reseeder but sometimes the fires were so cool it just maintained those bigger older older um, manzanitas but those were important and had many uses for medicinal as well as food and for fuel wood I'm just going to pause real fast to make sure that um, you're all hearing me and that there's not too much of a delay between when I switch slides. Is it going okay? Vanessa or yes. somebody? It's, okay. it's going well, yes. I think it's right. good. Thank you. I'm going to pause and make sure I'm not you know, going too fast. Thank you. So for basketry, you know, many of the culture from literally cradle to grave were important aspects and many aspects of basketry um, went all across the landscape. And so again, another one of Kat Anderson's work here looking at kind of the cycle for shrubs is, you know, this burning and this coppicing or pruning to maintain and promote long straight shoots. Um, also tied to this was definitely light or canopy conditions, um, but that maintaining and facilitating that work. So we have a range of species here found in our area. Um, willows along riparian areas, especially say exigua, the sandbar willow, um, the willow, uh, the hazel being one of the main important ones. Bear grass, as an understory of lily, those leaves were gathered uh, usually one year after burned, re regrowth leaves bleached in the sun, and then were this beautiful kind of light whitish tan color on these baskets. Here's an example of the hazel sticks um, that were harvested. The bark is peeled about the time that the, um, in the spring when the leaves are just about as big as the squirrel's ear, about a centimeter across. These sticks are peeled, and then the size of those sticks, they would make this hopper basket. You're looking at it upside down, but that'd be affixed to a rock and then grind acorns or other nuts or seeds within that. But we took the hazel sticks to be the main ribs of this basket. Part of this basket technology, if you weren't aware, um, to see this kind of more maroon looking color or this kind of reddish is the pounding of the red or white alder, but generally red alder bark to emulate flooding disturbance mixed with the two inner runners of the Woodwardia chain fern. That's tied and that's overlaid the pine root or spruce root to be this uh, reddish color on the basket. So that's kind of how those two systems come together to make that overlay. Maidenhair fern is also a very important one to be the black on that, the top stem um, used, but also repairing areas or springs did better if they got overgrown, burning those out on drier conditions of the late summer would facilitate the re-sprouts if it didn't consume too much of the duff. Um, or the material that this, the roots of the fern was growing in. And then to look at more of a common tan oak evergreen huckleberry forest type, get into a little bit of examples there. So, you know, really this time of year, just, you know, a month ago, I was gathering this stuff. I'm going back to my favorite large tan oak tree, looking in that injured spot, either as a fire scar or broken limb and getting this herisium, um, gathering California bay or pepper nuts. Um, getting the evergreen huckleberry, we had those two different species around our different types and varieties, the bloom, light blue one and the dark purple types, and then um, the other herbs that would be gathered in the fall time. But, you know, a lot of these ones were directly or indirectly affected by fire. And then just kind of a short list to go through some of these um, is to think about, you know, the types of huckleberries we have from the coast to the mountains, um, the different types of other berries, but many of them were used and, and fire was in one way to reduce diseases um, and promote their regrowth and reduce competition from shrubs and other trees. So for the huckleberry um, and 
Dr. Colleen Rozier, one of my students there, she's been working on this and just finished her PhD at Davis. She uh, looked at a lot of the management that increased huckleberry production. And so we know that burning pr improves that, but also the light dynamics. And as Laverne taught me, tip pruning, you can increase the predictability of the regrowth. It helps increase pollination because it's all flowers at one time and, um, and more collective nodes or clusters. And then also ripening is more consistent, which leads to eventually more efficient cleaning and a greater berry crop. Fire also definitely uh, benefited many other berries, whether it be uh, salmon berries on the coast and thimble berries, black caps, the little woodland strawberries, and then trailing blackberries um, were all benefited from fire and often reduced those diseases that affected those. And one that maybe people don't maybe realize so much was also madrone. Um, usually more madrones, you see these kind of legacy full crown, I call them upside down octopuses out there, but these multi-trunked large madrone trees this time of year, the pigeons and the robins are all over them, as well as other birds. Um, you know, that definitely that madrone also had a lot of wood, uh, important wood use for heating and cooking, but also the bark for medicinal purposes, uh, for scars and wounds. And then the drying out and storing the madrone berries um, were definitely a, a winter food resource. And I still quite gather quite a bit of these. They're good with dried huckleberries. And in another winter area, literally, um, there's two different, you know, our two different species here, but the amelanchier or service berry, um, post burn and the re-sprouts there were used for tools such as arrow tips and other things like that, arrow four shafts, but it was one of the also the energetically and, and nutrient wise and a very important food resource was to gather those um, service berries in the earlier summer, dry them out and mix them with other foods or fruits. And then just even going to our higher elevation places, um, many tribes made their seasonal rounds. And you know, often in the early fall, going up higher elevation, the saddle oak um, was a resource that grew back. This example on the left is two years or three years um, up there at Rock Creek Butte in the Siskiyou Wilderness area, where it was after the Siskiyou fire or the Blue Two fire, Siskiyou fire on this one. But the three years after growth, um, re-sprouts, there was a loaded crop of these saddler oak, and that feeds a lot of animals in the high country, and many tribes also targeted that resource, again, time since fire by severity, and knowing that was an important resource at higher elevations. Also, too, is elderberry, a very important one for food for the birds and for people, but then also the long straight shoots being used for clapper sticks or musical instruments and flutes. And then fire definitely helps sprouting that um, and would promote that elderberry in its patches across the landscape. And then I'll just you know touch base a little bit on the mushrooms. You know, many of the mushrooms that we have in our region, and then you can see the K. Anderson and Lake 2013 article on California ethnomycology, where I uh, Kat and I uh, write about this. But you know, we have ones that grow on deadwood. Um, Often as this alder here killed, uh, this I think this picture is actually from the Applegate area or the Lower Illinois River after the Biscuit Fire. Um, this was an alder that was killed by that fire and then uh, had these oyster mushrooms on it or you have the soil-based mushrooms. And then we have everything from the chanterelles or the morels um, and then the matsutakis are important. And then also those um, black trumpets. But many of those also still need just a little bit of duff or um, not completely bare mineral soil, maybe the morels do, but the other ones need a little bit of um, dust system there just to promote that mycorrhizal relationship. And I mentioned this already, but I'll get a little bit more example here on different Indian potato types um, that were found in many of the forest openings and the prairies and meadows. And whether it's the lilies um, gathering and harvesting of those scales, Many of the ethnographic information talk about tribes harvesting these more in the spring, I mean, sorry, rather in the fall, versus some more of the calicortis and rhodia type species being harvested in the spring or early summer. Um, so there are a lot of different lilies that were harvested at different times of years from different, or even sometimes a similar environment um, across these areas, but fire helped promote those as we know. And then the pollination service, many of these being very important for our pollinators in the region as well. And Kat Anderson has this example that she shows um, really looking at kind of the, the digging of the soap root or other ones, uh, leaving that little, I don't know what you call it, technically it's from a botany term, but I call it the little whisker root on the bottom and leading, uh, putting the seeds back in there and then both having um, genetic uh, reproduction with the seeds, but also um, 
um, cloning or whatever by leaving the other one behind. So you can really repeat this, but two different ways of reproducing or reproduction here for maintaining that patch of that silk root. And here's kind of an example of digging some of that with my Mount Mahogany digging stick, um, cooking them down to make that paste out of the, uh, out of the fibers and then, um, or out of the, 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 the onion part of it and then using those fibers that didn't dip in there to make brushes. Um, so they're like a little kind of whisk broom or a little barber's brush there. Many of the tiger lilies, um, again, some of these were important ones, more from the coast, but I even think things like the Kellogg's lily or some of the other ones, the Washingtonia, were eaten, although maybe not re reported so much in our area, but those were also those tiger lilies were important species. And then just to kind of quickly go through um, just some of the forbs and the other shrubs, you know, the madia or the, uh, the tarweed is an important resource for many of the kilma. A lot of the graphic accounts talk about burning that and the seed harvesting. Um, we find that all the way down through our area here in the Hoopa country. And then now I just want to, you know, switch gears just a little bit about, um, been talking for about over a half hour. I want to maybe wrap it up here in the next 10 minutes to save time for question and answer. But, you know, for me, I've compiled a lot of this information from various sources and, you know, to build upon tribal ecological knowledge to guide research, looking at multiple lines of evidence for various methods, long studies uh, with my colleagues and other graduate students um, and other universities are really treatment-based outcomes. Uh, so kind of, you know, thinking about what are the important methods that we can do this work and how that can be uh, guiding our seasonality of when and where to manage and use fire for developing prescriptions related to our treatments. I've talked about some of the trigger points or indicators that are of cultural importance um, that would guide when a resource, um, how and why it would be managed or why fire would be used there. And then really at the core of this is thinking about what metrics are important. So to look at say, for example, the hazel bush, it's just not the percent area or cover of hazel density um, but also some number of usable shoots. So thinking about as a botanist or an ecologist um, working at basket weavers, it's just not, again, the, the, the stem density is the number of usable shoots that might be the important metric or it might be the proportion of good to bad acorns. Or as uh, my work uh, with Colleen Rozier, her uh, huckleberry patch quality metric that she developed with practitioners with the Yurok and the Karuk. And then, you know, having that kind of form of indigenous knowledge help refine and, and guide our monitoring and really thinking about our adaptive management from these different species as resources within many habitats. And not to go into all these examples, but for me, you know, really bringing together through some of the paleoclimate and fire history studies. So uh, kind of a more of a longer term view. I've touched based on the ethnographic and oral history inf information that's important. Um, many of this looking at the ethnobotany, particularly the basketry and the foods and linking those plant traits to kind of the plot network. And then using my fixed area forestry plots, um, Characterize tree density, understory diversity, fuel loading, canopy closure, recover, and then also bringing us in now of other remote sensing like LIDAR or in our carbon work, um, linking that terrestrial laser scanning LIDAR to look at understory dynamics that affect the resource quality there. And then bringing in many different partners that address this work. In the context of why this might be valuable to society today and also be a benefit to the tribes. Um, you know, looking at this work, especially for field treatments and how indigenous knowledge informs those prescriptions to maintain and enhance those drought tolerant fire adaptive species um, that have a little bit more climatically adapt adaptive traits um, in the way of protecting life, property, and resources from undesired wildfires, thinking about our socio cultural well being and a form of security. Um, for many of the tribes, it's food security and cultural practices um, from those different habitats maintaining tribal access for the gathering or foraging quality um, of those. And then also thinking about the quantity and quality of habitat and resources. And so again, another one, the huckleberry, we can have a lot of evergreen huckleberry as an understory component, particularly on the coast and the redwood forest or the mixed evergreen, but if there's not enough light and it's not being stimulated by some form of disturbance like burning or pruning, um, you're not gonna have the berry production. So we lose that service. Um, and if we don't manage it, we don't enhance the opportunity for both people and for animals out in the environment. And then putting this in the context of, you know, how we have our manual, which is often chainsaw thinning, or the mechanical, which is like restoration forestry or logging, and then the other uh, treatments of how we reduce the fuel loading and maybe open up those tree species or vegetation types we want to promote more of. Um, and in some cases, suppress fires where we desire or require that, managing for resource objectives as part of the incident command uh, objectives. And in some cases today, because of conservation or protected areas, 
we may manage areas for longer fire returnables today, or maybe they might have been more frequently burned historically. So we have to think about kind of the, the intersection of today's values on the landscape as well. For me, this is kind of put within a framework of looking, thinking about our landscape restoration strategies um, and finding strategic places to manage across the landscape to promote that heterogeneity and resilience, putting it in the context of our climate change vulnerability assessments and adaptation planning to identify those threats and stressors or other disturbances that are climate related. For many of the tribes, it's kind of putting this within a cultural ecosystem services framework. And then also really nesting this within bigger authorities or strategies um, like the National Cohesive Strategy for Wildland Fire, um, where we think about resilient landscapes, fire adapted communities, our ability to live in, with wildfire for tribes, also as fire dependent cultures, linking that to our wildfire management responses, and then bringing those rural or even in some cases our urban um, community and tribal values in alignment. And then, um, do I have about three more minutes here? How are we doing on my time? You're good. good for, yeah, you're great. Okay, well, good. I'm going to hit on a few of these ones and I'll probably slow down and I'll take questions because I've been going through it. So, you know, when we think about what is like restoration and what are we restoring for? And so there's some working definitions here um, about what that is. I like this one, but, you know, the practice of reestablishing historical plant and animal communities of a given area or region and the renewal of that ecosystem and cultural functions necessary to maintain those communities now and into the future. Oops, I know what I wanted to say, my picture there. So you see this huge Canyon live oak. Um, I'm standing next to there, that picture taken by Michael Hintz of the mid Klamath Watershed Council. Um, I could literally step on that first branch kind of to the lower left and walk up to that place where all those trunks or branches come together. And this to me is a cultural legacy in the sense that this tree um, really significantly teaches me how to live with fire. It wouldn't have grown as full crown structure in more of even a natural fire lightning regime. It's the specificity of burning around this tree that historically would have had low fuel loads, allowed that full open branch growth, and then really a lot of diversity, both topographically where this was at and a lot of other hardwoods and conifers within this um, area. So sometimes we have the architecture, the structural part of this vegetation that's an indicator of um, what we could be managing or living with fire in an area. So in thinking about our forest landscape restoration for indigenous approaches, you know, kind of think about what degradation is and what it means. Um, perhaps, you know, conflict can arise between those local communities and other stakeholders um, who see this, uh, the, see the factors of degradation or conservation needs and restoration approaches differently. I also think that in your, in your government, the government relationship, or when you're doing scoping and outreach of tribes, the stakeholder maybe isn't the best term. Um, you know, we think about staking a claim, claiming land, um, also having that kind of colonial settler aspect of, you know, ownership. So we just have to think about even the legacy of the words that we use when we reach out and work with tribes and the culturally appropriateness of some of those that might have some trauma associated with them, um, especially from colonization and Euro-American settlement in those regions or our area. And then just thinking about the knowledge applications. Um, you know, many tribes are guarded with their traditional ecological knowledge and really want to make sure that that is available with the freedom of informed consent and that there's, you know, data sharing management agreements in place. There's agreement on how that knowledge is going to be used or shared. We can gain some of it from ethnographic information, but really building these partnerships today is important to have tribes be clear on how they want to share and to what way. Often I tell some new graduate students or other people, you know, um, when you ask questions, take if you're wanting to know the answer, you're going to have to have a responsibility for the knowledge you seek. And I think it's different in like professor office hours where we just want to go get an answer. When we're talking with elders or tribal leaders, um, when you're asking for something, think about the knowledge that you're requesting and then what responsibility you're going to have with that for, and for that knowledge as a knowledge steward. I definitely think about that every day of my life. Knowledge steward. Um, we talked about the reference condition. I'm going to skip through that. And I'm going to end on this last slide so we can get into some discussion here and go over 7-2. But, you know, really think about tribes and organizations as your research partner. Learn about what the researchable questions and science support needs are. Support and development, you know, that the government, the government uh, consultation or other agreements and, and, and mechanisms of that. Think about tribal input uh, and participation with your study design or your monitoring. And then really, you know, think about how that creates the best available science to inform management and policy. And then really at the core of this is having respectful knowledge sharing amongst both indigenous and Western scientists or managers 
for all of us that live as part of this community in our great environment here. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, that was a really dense amount of information. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if there's any way to um, get like a list of your sources. And you mentioned a lot of people that you've co-authored with and other um, authors that you reference. And it's it just seems like there's a plethora of knowledge referenced in your slides. And I was like trying to Google stuff while you were talking. Yeah, no. So anyway. what I would say that the quick one-stop shopping, thankfully, um, is my Forest Service website has the trees Great. search, and you can see a list of all my publications there. And then Brandon I'll put Schultz. That up for folks. Yeah, Brandon Schultz with the PSW, um, our uh, public affairs coordinator, or it was a it was a communication shop. He makes sure and uploads all my all my um, recent manuscripts that are, you know book chapters and articles and things like that. Awesome. So that's tree search the Forest here. Service and she should see my publication page. Yeah, awesome. And, and I then also to with also... Um, my, my colleagues, Jonathan Long with the PSW Research Station in Davis and then Chairman Ron Good with the North Fork Mono. We have several different articles that just came out. Um, one in Vermontia um, with uh, recentering indigenous perspectives for restoration. And then we have another one that came out um, on a tribal perspective of, of restoration. So, you know, there's some other work there that's more specific for restoration. And then those other ones I have on forest landscape restoration as well with John Parada. Awesome. So, cool. yeah, but if you go to my Forest Service website, you'll find a lot of those there. Nice, that's great. I, um, while we're just wrapping that up, um, if folks wanna post any questions you have in the chat, I think we have a lot of people muted. Um, and you can also yeah. I don't know if I'll be turning off my screen. I was trying to think of going all the way back up to some kind of place of talking here. I mean, I definitely included lots and lots of stuff, but uh, how do I get back up here? I'm trying to figure out one of those bigger overview slides. Oh yeah. There we go. Um, cool. So um, I'm just going to read some of the. Okay, there's some uh, note, noting that this talk will be posted on the NPSO Facebook page. And um, Colleen Sanders is commenting, thank you so much, Frank, for all of your knowledge and NPSO. Speaker question, what role did the traditional pit earth oven play in the management of soil and habitat health of native plants in the forest grassland system? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting, you know, a lot of um, Don Tote, who used to be with Ashland Parks and Rec, some years ago, we did a pit oven demonstration there, probably about 15 years ago now, uh, there in Ashland, and it really got me thinking um, and looking at the archaeological information about how often many tribes in the area use pit ovens to cook their food, both root foods and in game, and, you know, I think the softer soil types on the edges of meadows, where those would be dug out, and then you think about middens and the, the, the side casting or the dumping of a lot of that organic material would be forms of soil enrichment and aeration. Um, often people, because they were rock lined and had to have certain basalt or other kind of more rocks that the integrity wouldn't fracture, pit ovens could be used continually as, as a family hearth and cooking um, food resources. So this wasn't always having to dig a new one. But I think, you know, in work of archaeologists, a lot of these meadows or other places around the village you can have that midden, which is really a soil lens of ex extreme enrichment. And, you know, many times now that the village has been forgotten about, it's a state park or a national park or private land, you'll just see this like really black rich soil. And people are like, oh, there's a lot of plant diversity there. Well, it's kind of like the legacy of an old kitchen um, midden pile, you know, compost pile. And, and those, as we see in the Amazon, there was long-term soil formation I think it was anthropocils or whatever the term is called for those if I get it right. But we had the same thing here. You know, there definitely was enrichment around um, tribal gardens and the areas where they had pit oven cooking and kind of the compost pile that promoted also another level of diversity in soil enrichment. From what I've learned. Also another cool. important element of that is thinking about biochar. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is a great Valerie. Answer. Valerie Miller has a question and I, I asked her to unmute. I'm not I think she is unmuted. 
now and there are a few more hi um i have like i've learned ecology of this area for a really long time and oftentimes it's um been told to me that fire is good for so many species and very few times i've had it explained to me how so i wonder if you could speak to the physiological mechanisms that allow for um, plants to re-sprout or for seeds to germinate or really how the fire interacts with the plants. Um, that would be, yeah, that's what I would like to know. That probably is out of the scope of what I'm going to talk about and I'm not going to venture there other than that, you know, certain species like the manzanitas I talked about, some are burl sprouters. So when they get burned, they re-sprout from that lignotumor or burl. Other ones need a certain amount of scarification or heat disturbance um, and bare mineral soil in which to germinate. And so really it depends upon the life history adaptation. And here, I thought I saw Susan Harrison on the call, my old uh, Davis prof uh, professor. You're gonna look at Grimes' uh, life history attributes of plant adaptations and how they adapt to different forms of disturbance. And if you think of fire as central to that or herbivory, you'll see many different plants, even though they're fire dependent species in our area have different survival strategies for reproducing and, and persistence. So anyways, that's, I'm not going to go down that hole right there without having, you know, there's other things here, uh, more on the plant uses and, and stewardship. But yeah, there's other ways. And I think at the core of that is Native people did understand different life history requirements of these species, pretty plants, and how they would respond, whether it's epicormic sprouting or the ligo tumor or the effects of coppicing and causing, you know, bud densification for more desired sprout, sprouting. Um, but, you know, again, fire is kind of more of a, a could be mechanical or a physiological factor that would cause the plant to change its morphological condition that for many tribes, they realize that would give them the kind of shape and condition they want out of that species. Thank you. I'll try and post a link um, maybe to the author that Frank is mentioning, Grimes. He was active in like the 60s and 70s in terms of what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, dating myself um, too on that one. <laughs> It was a great, you're not, it's like essential for plant uh, community dynamics. Um, so Christina Lefebvre asks, how can we incorporate this important information about how critical fire is to healthy ecosystems into the current white culture? Um, and she also asks sort of out about the practice of living in permanence in a place and how to start thinking about incorporating the work that you're talking about into contemporary culture. Yeah, well, there's, you know, I think there's a lot of partnerships. I would say locally in your area, in Southern Oregon, Loma Cotsi, um is definitely looking at ways to, you know, work with the tribes and they are doing a lot of work with around restoration and I've done workforce training with them for years on thinking about, you know, how do we consider indigenous management and the restoration of these habitats to reintroduce fire. Um, also, I think in Southern Oregon, you have a new extension specialist, if I get Chris Adams, um, information right. So Chris uh, just came up from Davis finishing his PhD. He's worked a lot with cultural burning. So, you know, use him as a resource. Um, the Nature Conservancy folks with the Ashen Resiliency Project over there have done a lot of, you know, looking and their fire history studies in the area. But, you know, there's also, there's a, a kind of a debate around many cases on the seasonality often of fire use today, spring that might be more sensitive for some of the nesting birds or um, reproduction of animals uh, versus some more of the historical time periods in which fire would have been used and thinking about the reintroduction of that for fall or the dormant seasons of the year. So I, you know, I, I think this is just a start, but um, you know, there's a lot more literature coming out now and publication, particularly with tribes, about the uses of importance of fire. And again, to my studies, proudly working with a really great team of different scientists and graduate students that are scientists come up and coming, is that culturally appropriate metric that looks at, you know, not the study didn't validate the traditional knowledge. It helps co create that science to inform management. And I think that's a way of changing the way we go about doing our work is what are those kind of um, the utility of knowledge integration for creating that best available science to inform our management strategies today. And because we also have, you know, in many cases, novel aspects of our environment now that we may think about using fire differently. Um. Frank, I'll, I'll throw one. Uh, Janine Moy asks, what's the connection? Also, she says, thank you so much for your presentation, but what's the connection between service berry health and cedar? 
Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so I believe it's often the instant cedar infects a rust. There's like a kind of an orangey rust that will infect the berries, the surface berries. And so anecdotally or some scientific paper out there, I just basically see if you're not burning around service berry and there's an encroachment of instant cedar, it seems like there's a higher correlation between that orangey rust that affects the berries and you don't get good fruit set. So I've always, you know, been kind of sometimes those serpentine edges around those other areas, um, you got to kind of have a little bit more open and, and, and good growing conditions for that service berry so it doesn't have the orange rust on those berries. Um, okay, and then Susan Harris had a question. Uh, said She says, hi, Frank, what a wonderful talk. Thank you. Question, people talk a lot about pyrodiversity these days. Is that a part of indigenous knowledge or traditional and ecological knowledge? I would definitely say, thank you, Susan. Um, you know, for pyrodiversity, I think the important elements, and I had so many slides, I didn't include this one that I typically do, but you know, the the adaptation and the formation of a cultural fire regime really gets at the diversification of seasonality. So burning at different times of the year than lightning. So it could be, you know, earlier in the fall, later in the fall, cold, dry winters, early spring before the bud break or phenologically before animals start migrating and mating. Um, also the frequency, diversifying, often increasing the frequency of fire in places. Um, you want, you know, you could wait randomly for lightning to maybe strike there every 12 to 15 or 20 years, or you can burn it on a, a cycle and system that is based with cultural indicators. The specificity, burning sp particular areas, even with ignition pattern, to have that fire line intensity or fire intensity and get the desired severity you want. So often burning from a ridge and backing that fire down the hill will moderate fire uh, intensity and result in severity, or burning in many cases some of those shrub fields get lighted off towards the bottom and it would carry through there. And so also as part of that, that I've seen that's often missed by the literature, um, but learned this by working with Stanford University in Amardu in Australia, uh, Western Desert was even within a season because of the fuel moisture in between storms, any time that that fuel bed or vegetation was receptive to burning and they thought it needed to be burned, they would burn it. And then it might get a cold weather system come in and rain then two weeks later it would dry up and that other area that you just burned two weeks ago would start to green up and then you'd burn right up against that. So even though it might be a certain season, you could even have much a lot of fine mosaic scale burning within and across different habitats or in our area burning between a north aspect and a south aspect and working off solar insulation and some of those dynamics that are biophysically setting that for moisture in the soil and, and things and then using that different aspect as a barrier to fire spread. And so I really think, you know, the mosaic and those within scale diversity is what added that pyrodiversity that often is missed. And then thinking about just not the extensive fire patches that we have across huge watersheds, but think about many small pockets and many of the fire history studies in our area done by um, other scientists and myself, some look at really, um, the seasonality and frequency of burning, and then the compartments in which that is within watersheds, but really, again, also topographically defined, but then a much finer scale mosaic within those areas that we've just kind of lost today through fire exclusion and fire suppression. You know what I'd say is homogenization and losing that pyrodiversity and then have a lot more fire intolerant species that shade everything out. I think if I can go, here's this example I was getting at that one right there. So this kind of looks at that diagram. You know, you could kind of have more of a lightning regime on top, culturally modified pyrodiversity that has more forbs in the understory, bigger, more open ground trees or with fire exclusion and removal of native burning, a more dense closed forest that you lose all the understory diversity that's smothered in dust, litter and surface fuel. Thank you. Um, Teresa, way up in there. I don't know, Valerie, if we should alternate or if you should just do them, but I'm just seeing that Teresa had a I, question. She says, just... what was your process yeah. for getting? Hey, yeah, I can ask the question if you, if that's okay. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, Frank, I just know it can be really challenging and a lot of work and legalities to get fire on the land. And you showed an example of you doing so on your land. So I was just wondering how your process to accomplish that and, you know, tools, legalities, whatever it, takes, you know, um, and I work for a 
uh, land trust. And so, I mean, we have dreams of getting fire on the land one day too, and we know what it takes also. Um, but it's interesting because maybe as a private landowner, you did that. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, two things, and I might point you to the nature, the, the National Geographic article that came out today by Charles Mann as my, my example from this year and there of not being able to burn. But yeah, National Geographic just has a story by Charles Mann today that came out on this whole topic. Um, and, you know, really in the past, when I was part of that Klamath River Treks, I was part of, as a landowner, part of their um, burn plan that then also had a smoke management plan for the air quality district. And then because they were able to come in with 20 plus people and all fire trained qualified individuals, I had enough resources in both holding um, and being able to safely and implement that burn based on the complexity of my area, which is very small, five acres between me and my neighbor's property on the other side. And so I had one, you know, being brought into a larger um, landowner plan as part of the, the training exchange, part of the air quality smoke emission, uh, smoke management plan, had the fire personnel there that were um, enough for the permit that would be issued by the Forest Service, or in our case, CAL FIRE, which is either LE5 or LE7 for burning. But then this year, um, because of the burn ban uh, across California uh, and the concern of so many resources being out still fighting wildfires, it was very prohibitive in trying for me as a landowner to burn less than an acre. I needed to have at least, I think it was 12 firefighter type twos, a burn boss type two that takes quite a bit of training. I needed to have a fire engine with a certain amount of capacity, like a type three or type four engine. Um, I needed to have additional water on, on site, like a couple thousand gallons, like my water tank, have the fire lines in, have the hose lay. And that was just to burn, a, to burn anything less than 15 acres. And for me, it just wasn't possible. I mean, this is an area that's had numerous treatments through the Fire Safe Council flash program uh, a, a research burn in June 2013, uh, a follow-up thinning in, by me and pile burning, me using the NRCS Equip Environmental Quality Incentive Program with a conservation plan for my forest and improvement and my woody debris disposal practices um, in that unit, me burning a, a portion of it last year as part of my air quality non-standard permit for burning up to one acre or 10 by 10 piles, on a permissive burn day for my zone two. <laughs> and then, you know, that was able to be last year, but this year, because of the fire restrictions, I would have needed all those other resources. And so I think part of it is really based on the, the, the current and existing fire, the aversion to liability from the, who is gonna approve that permit, whether it's the state responsibility area, the Forest Service for CAL FIRE in my case, and then having enough resources to conduct that burn. Now, uh, Linda Quinn Davidson over here works quite a bit on the California Prescribed Fire Associations and Prescribed Fire Councils. The burn association model is one where landowners can come together and pull their resources, meet enough of the fire personnel they need to conduct that burn. But for me doing less than an acre, it was really, you know, I'm not gonna ask people to drop their larger prescribed burns they're working on to come burn, you know, an acre under 10 trees with me um, that I could easily do, but because of the aversion to it, how fire wouldn't issue the permit. So, you know, last year was a go. I uh, did it with one other guy. He, he basically had like what they call a little slide on pump that had 120 gallons with 50 feet of hose in the back of his little Subaru. We were able to burn off the same patch. This year it was a no-go. And I think because of a prescribed fire got away, there wasn't enough firefighter resources there to be able to respond once it was determined to be a wildfire and suppress it. What's your um, view on, given, given the real fire risk of last year, especially towards the end of the summer, um, do you think that was the right call? Or do you think that in a better scenario, you could still do it? I um, think that we need to be able to scale the prescribed burning or cultural burning to the level of the complexity of the unit you're burning. Um, and so when I talked with the Cal Fire prevention officer down here, it was kind of like, well, you should have got this process started earlier rather than two days before you want to burn. I said, I asked them months ago, but everybody laughed at me and kind of scoffed as I came off working as a wildfire resource advisor, like you want to prescribe burning this middle fire season. And then I tried to get myself as part of the Klamath River Trex roster for properties to burn. 
but that day they were burning a 60 plus acre unit around Orleans. And why would I pull off 15 people to come help me burn an acre that pretty much has had so many former treatments and has very low risk? It, you know, it, it's kind of a more, I'd say, call made at a, a higher level for a statewide burn ban where Northern California or Southern Oregon comes into prescription and we can get the right aisle deal conditions to burn. But because there's other places politically or management wise that are having to manage wildfires that they're just not gonna take the, take the risk, right? Um, and so I, I think, you know, often early getting that on there, but there needs to be a better system, I would say for private landowners to be able to get their property approved and looked at and demonstrate they have the capacity and knowledge to conduct a burn. I think unfortunately too, in my realm of working both as a research scientist and as a private landowner who's a tribal descendant, there can be a little bit of Western colonial bias in that we're the fire managers who have the National Wildfire Coordinating Group, we're the qualified firefighters and you're just a landowner, what do you really know about fire? And sometimes that can come across really, um, um, uh, you know, offensive, I guess, you know, um, and, and really working with elders and other people who, who are capable of doing it, but then you're told. Also other tribal people have told me um, that, you know, they never relinquished their right to hunt, gather, fish, or burn. And, you know, it's almost implicit in those treaties that were ratified or unratified that you manage the resources that you hunt through fire. You manage the resources that you gather through burning. You managed even the fishery resources I showed with the iris and for net connecting that to water through burning. So to look at a longer cultural cycle of fire and the establishment of that is I think something that we need to reconsider today in order to live with fire, but also how we say kind of, you know, in the fire management and research side of it, we have to increase the pace and scale of fire. But if you're always gonna need to rely upon uh, those uh, in the, the yellows and greens with the fire training and then, you know, $2,000 worth of gear on their back just to burn, you're going to really miss the social cultural family based aspect that it was historically and that we probably need to restore today if we're going to actively get fire at many fine scales of my little yeah. five acres, yeah. your 10 acres, yeah. a collaborative 100 acre ranch or conservancy, and then coming together to maintain those fire dependent species across our ecoregion. Yeah, definitely. Um, I I, Vanessa, I'm just going to get this one that was way up in the uh, questions. The speaker question, what role did the traditional pit earth oven play in the management of soil and habitat health of native plants in the forest grassland ecosystem? I think we got that one already. I talked about, you know, oh, the, you? the, the mids oh, yeah. and things okay, like that. And okay, Vanessa, you're up. <laughs> um, I think that Kevin Talbert wanted to unmute and say hello and ask a question if you're still with us. Um, I don't know if he needs help to unmute because we might he, have some settings. He looks like he's unmuted. I gave him permission already and I think he is unmuted already. We can wait a few seconds. Maybe he's grabbing chamomile tea or something. <laughs> well, you know, and then also in all fairness to my family, my wife and the kids have been in the back room for almost an hour and a half now. So, you know, the evening talks are kind of hard. I thought one point last week I was going to be in a research lab, but now with the shelter in place, um, I'm essentially maximizing telework even right now. So with everybody, I might just say thank you if that's fine and then uh, sign out and let my family have the house back in the front room here where I'm at. Thank you so much, Frank. Thank you so much, Frank. Thank you. All righty. Well, um, we really again, you. you know, for looking for my resources, I would say go to my Forest Service Trees uh, search webpage and um, look at some of those references there. And uh, again, I hope this, you know, gets you thinking about maybe fire and, and a way that we maybe can live more compatibly with it because it's, it's not going to go anywhere. It's a matter of uh, when, not if. When, it, you know, we either have wildfire in terms that we want to manage and uh, work with it or we can be proactive with our prescribed cultural burning and kind of get ahead of the situation, I think. Awesome. Great parting right, words. Thanks Have so a much. great night. Thank you. All right. Happy holidays, everybody, and uh, stay well and healthy.